Welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Christy Dimmick and I am the social committee chair this year for the board. And this is... I'm Kyle Kelly. Woo! That's all I have to say. And he's the social committee chair for next year. So we teamed up and just decided these next two years are going to be awesome. Because have you missed getting together? Let's be honest. Yeah, yeah let's hear it. <laughs> so just so you know, we have about 90 here at the Dry Bar Comedy. And then we also have pretty good uh, amount at the UCAR, at UCAR, um, watching live, streaming. We also, some of you probably saw, sent out the link so that people can watch from their homes, which is awesome. And then also, we will be recording this event and sending it out to everybody after. So really, anybody involved in our board could actually be a part of this and watch uh, the, the event. So hopefully that helps with connection and unity as well as just trying to get together again. So. Um, first off, just a big round of applause and thank you to Michelle Elmendorf. Where's Michelle? There she is right there. With IBEX Home Warranty providing our concessions here at Dry Bar Comedy. Thank you so much, Michelle, for your generosity. You're amazing. And then also UCAR has provided the refreshments at the UCAR site, the live streaming site. So let's hear it for UCAR. Woohoo! At the end of our event, or after the comedian is finished, and we've laughed our heads off, um, stay put because we have some giveaways. So we'll be doing those, and we are going to have those picked already so that we just read through them, so it's very quick. Um, but please stay seated if you can at UCAR and here at the Dry Bar Comedy so that we can uh, give away those prizes. So other house rules that we have. Yeah, so there's a couple of house rules just to keep in mind. Uh, first off, while the comedian's up here, please do your best to stay in your seats. You can have your masks off while you're at your chairs. If you want to keep them on, that's fine. Uh, restrooms, we have the restrooms down in the corner. And I told my wife I wouldn't say this, but if you need a pee pee or poo poo, that's where you go. Figure this is a comedy event, you can say inappropriate things. That didn't get very many laughs, so I apologize, honey. Uh, thanks. That's terrible. That's terrible. Um, so the other, uh, the other thing is just make sure you're courteous. Uh, this is our first social event in a long time. Uh, let's see, uh, 2019, they asked me to be the committee chair for the tech committee. And then they dissolved the tech committee in 2020. And then in 2020, uh, they also asked me to be part of the social committee. And then we did nothing socially because COVID. And then this year, they wanted me to be a part of the social committee so that we could hopefully uh, do some activities here in 2021. So we're here, we've made it. And the hope is, is that uh, I'm supposed to be the chair next year and we can continue doing activities. But this year, I consider myself kind of like the vice president, like the Kamala of the, the social committee, which means she doesn't have it very long before I take over, right? <laughs> Hey, political joke, went good. Thank you, thank you. Um, so just, uh, just a couple of things in advance. Uh, my job here now is to just kind of lighten you up and tell you some bad jokes so when the good jokes happen, you laugh a little bit louder, uh, give a better applause. So there's a couple of things for you. First, in preparation for tonight, I sent a ton of emails to the uh, dry bar. And one of the things on their checklist was that they needed somebody to be the host and make announcements. And so naturally we both figured we could do that. So I sent back an email thinking I was pretty awesome and said, hey, I'm happy to be the MC. Now I put the letters MC, not knowing that there's actually a spelling for MC. So the person from Dry Bar wrote me back and said, yeah, we're happy to have you be the MC, but in quotations put E-M-C-E-E. -E. I didn't know that was a word and I thought it was always an acronym. So I looked it up because I didn't believe her and found out that when I type in the word or the letters MC, it comes up with uh, Montgomery College is the first one. And then as you go down the list, you go to, uh, what is it? Uh, what's that uh, website where you get all these uh, cool urban words? Oh yeah, that's where you guys get your spelling too. Okay, so that was what I did. So Urban Dictionary says that MC is the right way to spell it with letters MC, and I went with that. And that's the mic controller. I thought that was pretty good. So I typed in the way they spelled it, which is E-M-C-E-E. -E. Does anybody know what that actually means? Nobody. Wow, this is bad. So Master of Ceremonies is what it's supposed to be, which the acronym is MC. 
So I'm going to go and be your MC for tonight, which is the mic controller, because Urban Dictionary is right, not Webster Dictionary. So we're going to stick with that. Um, and I'm with Century 21 Bush now. I'm a realtor. I'm with you guys. We're out there, and it's a crazy market. I mean, how many houses are we putting under contract right now? No, we're zero. Like, there's not houses going on under contract. What is it, 1,700 for the whole state right now? That's not going to get us a lot. And so. I just wanted to kind of get a gauge of the room. How many people have put in an offer for a client five times or more? Raise your hand. Not on the same night, just in general. Yeah. How about seven? Keep your hands up. Okay. These guys are dedicated. Ten? Okay. It's crazy, right? How many of you guys have a house that's under contract right now representing the buyer? Raise your hand. Okay. You guys are evil because that doesn't work. That doesn't happen. That's really rude. So with the market the way that it is, I've tried to make it a little more fun. So when I go into a house, if I'm representing a buyer, I figure I've got the mask on. Nobody knows who I am. I can do random voices. My favorite one is Bane from The Dark Knight. And uh, I figure I've got the muscles and the shaved head, got the mask. And one of those three is a true statement. Let you decide. But I go in there and I, uh, I do. This is not the horse you want. And I tell that to people and they don't know where it's coming from and they walk out and hopefully my clients will get it. That hasn't worked yet. So I've gone on to the other way with our own homes that I'm helping represent on the open house. One of the things that I do on the open house is I do voices, but I learned that from here at Dry Bar with one of the comedians. What they said to do is people don't traditionally follow uh, what you're saying. If you do it in a normal voice, you're good. But if you whisper it, they think you're creepy. I didn't know if that was true or not. So I tried it out. At one of the open houses, somebody came in with their kids and I said, hey, those are some great kids you've got there. Said it in a normal voice. They were like, hey, thanks, man. That's great. We love our kids. They're, fa they're fantastic. That went well. So I tried it with the next group that came in with kids and I whispered it. I said, you've got some great kids there. <laughs> they didn't seem to appreciate that very well and they left immediately. So I'm hoping that you guys can find a way to have fun with the real estate market. Find a way to be positive, help people not lose their motivation to be out there and looking at houses. So we're gonna actually get to some good jokes so that you can actually laugh for real and not give me these pity laughs. Let's go on to our comedian and I'll give you a little bit of announcement about him. Uh, first off, he's now my best friend. I just met him five seconds ago. So uh, we are really good friends. He's gonna hang out with me after. And he's a stand-up comedian and a Diet Coke drinker from Salt Lake City, Utah. Uh, just a moment ago, he told me he had stopped for one day, which is a great accomplishment. Uh, he's performed at comedy festivals all over the country, including Boston Comedy Festival, Big Sky Comedy Festival, the Seattle International Comedy Competition, and then he was the name of Best of Fest at the Golden Spike Comedy Festival, and then there's the winner of the Finger Lakes Comedy Festival in Ithaca, New York. In 2016, he was both voted the best comedian by City Weekly Magazine. And then he had a debut comedy special on Amazon, Spurious. So let's give it up to our comedian here, Alex Veludo. Oh, thank you. Give it up for my new best friend. Couldn't tell you his name, but we will hang out all the time. So you guys are all seller, buyer's agents? Most of you? You're both, both, you do both, okay. I was worried I was just gonna have to provide emotional support for an hour. Huh? <laughs> There's no houses for us to sell. No, you guys are doing great then, huh? Give it up for yourself. You guys are killing it better than Bitcoin. <laughs> you need to invest in Utah house coin. There's nothing out there. You guys into Bitcoin too? Anybody? Good, that's a scam. I'm with you. Freaking Bitcoin. <laughs> I don't believe in, in Bitcoin. When it came out, you could only use it on the dark web. And then all of a sudden, people decided it was a good investment opportunity. Have you heard of the dark web? Anything good coming out of the dark web? You're never at a party like, oh yeah, these brownies are delicious. Where'd you get the recipe? She's like, the dark web. <laughs> Got it on dark Pinterest. No, the dark web. That's where you could spend Bitcoin when it came out. And then it became an investment. 
people acted like it was good investment. I'm like, of course it's a good investment. It's crime. <laughs> crime is always a good business model. <laughs> That's why they have to make crime illegal, is it's too good of a business. If you pitched crime on Shark Tank, you'd get bought immediately. <laughs> like, hi, sharks. I'd like an investment in my company where I sell, get this, cocaine. <laughs> Like, what's your strategy for getting repeat customers? They're like, oh, it's an addictive product. <laughs> and then Mr. Wonderful, you know how Mr. Wonderful, he always asks about competition. What will you do about your competition? Do you have the patent? What will you do about competition? And you go, well, here's what I do about competition in my business. In my business, if I have competition, I, uh, I kill them. <laughs> it's a great business model. <laughs> My real estate agent couldn't be here. I invited her and she didn't come. <laughs> Shelly Blair, anyone know Shelly? <laughs> yeah, she said she was gonna come. Do you guys know each other, by the way? All, yeah. oh, is there like a, Woo! yeah. I just heard, here's all the info I got for the event is that it's a bunch of real estate agents and I said, perfect. <laughs> I didn't know if you knew each other. So you all know each other. That's good. You don't want to be out with people you don't know. Especially nowadays. You don't know what they believe. Ugh. <laughs> Look around you. There's some people you don't know here. Look at them. Look at them in their wrong opinion having faces. <laughs> some people here don't believe what you believe, and I think that's dumb. I think they should believe what you believe. I'm on your side. I like to ride the fence. I'll tell you what you want to hear, I don't care. <laughs> That's what I'm here for. I'm just here to make you laugh and make you feel good. Let me tell you something about my real estate agent though. When I was, I bought a house 2017? So a little while ago. And she took me out and she said this to get me started. She said, the house will pick you because you'll feel at home there. And the first house she took me to was just a complete dump. <laughs> I'm like, what made you think I would like living in this hovel? <laughs> She's like, well, you got to know what you don't want in order to know what you do want. Which, I've never heard that used in any other way other than houses. You're never like, hey, where do you want to go eat, guys? You're like, I don't know. Let's look in this dumpster to see what we don't want. <laughs> Ooh, a dirty diaper. Definitely don't want that. <laughs> That does make me want chicken nuggets, though, now that I know what I don't want. <laughs> Didn't make any sense. But we did find a house that we like, and as you know, I had to do a home inspection on it, and as part of that, they had to test for meth, and the, the limit of meth in a house is one meth units. <laughs> I don't know, what's the unit? Scabs? I have no idea. So, at one scab, you can't live in the house. <laughs> so I was waiting, and my house came back at point one scabs. <laughs> Which I found out was just enough meth to make me feel at home there. That's what it was. I walked in there, and I'm like, I feel great in here. It's a fixer-upper, but I've got the energy all of a sudden to fix it. I think this will be great. <laughs> They say love turns a house into a home, but I say meth makes a very good substitute. I'm getting a sign from my doorway that says, live, laugh, meth. <laughs> Forgot I had this on, I'll take it off. I'll take it off so you don't think I'm making a political statement. It's tense these days. I will say this, nonpartisan take on masks. As an ugly person, it's been very nice for me to be having the masks. <laughs> so good. <laughs> Let me tell you, we in the ugly community had no idea there was even a pandemic happening. <laughs> they were just like, you know what? Cover your face and stand as far away from people as you can. They're like, we understand. <laughs> in fact, this is the moment we've been training for our entire lives. <laughs> I'm happy things are getting back to normal though, like Golden Corral's back open. That's how you know things are back to normal. <laughs> Which I do not know how they're gonna keep Golden Corral safe post-pandemic. 
Before the pandemic, I felt like I was gonna get COVID. <laughs> and I had no idea what COVID was. I'm like, I don't know, but this roast beef looks like it has bat wings in it or something. <laughs> I don't know how they're gonna keep it safe. My only guess is that you like go in there and you have to order from a waiter, which that's gonna be embarrassing, putting in your buffet order out loud <laughs> to another human being. You don't want to admit your buffet order to yourself. You just go through the buffet dodging eye contact, like, don't look at me while I do this to myself. <laughs> they want you to put it in with a waiter? How's that going to work? They come to your table, like, what would you like to order off the menu at Golden Corral? And you're like, buckle up, muchacho. <laughs> I want an entire rack of ribs, first of all. And next to it, I would like a piece of chocolate cake. <laughs> yes, for the first course. What are you, my mother? <laughs> and next to that, I'd like mashed potatoes and gravy. And you're not going to be able to prevent it, but uh, the gravy's going to get on the chocolate cake. <laughs> and I've accepted that. <laughs> and next to that, I want some ice cream. And I kind of want the ice cream to melt into the gravy on purpose. <laughs> Look, it happened to me on accident in 07, and I've been doing it ever since, so. All that on one plate, please. They're like, we don't think that's all going to fit on one plate. And like, oh, it'll fit. I know from experience it'll fit. Lots of tension these days. I'm hoping to alleviate some tension tonight. There's so much tension, and I think it's because of all these opinions people have. I don't think you should have opinions. That's just my humble opinion. <laughs> there's so many people talking. In the history of talking, there's never been more people talking than right now. Everyone's talking all the time. And I know I'm a hypocrite because I'm talking right now. <laughs> but it's ridiculous. Remember when the phone companies came out and they're like, you can talk to five people. It turns out that was the perfect amount of people to talk to in your life. You don't need to talk to all these randos. I love the First Amendment, but we are using it too much. We're wearing that bad boy out. <laughs> Everyone's talking all the time. You know what my, my favorite amendment to the Constitution is? The Fifth Amendment. <laughs> the right to remain silent. <laughs> it's my favorite one. I, I use it in everyday life. Like when people... They're like, have you seen this YouTube video? And instead of just showing you the frickin' YouTube video, they explain the video to you. When they do that, I'm like, I'd like to talk to my lawyer. I'd like to invoke the Fifth Amendment at this time. So much, so much talking and so many opinions. And look, I love you no matter what your opinions are. That's the honest truth. I don't care what they are. I love you either way. I don't care. Like, and I, usually I can understand you even if we don't agree. I get it. Like, you may believe in a conspiracy theory that is different from the conspiracy theory that I believe in. <laughs> I don't care. I get it. I have, I'm also mentally ill. You don't think I believe in conspiracy theories? <laughs> I have social anxiety. You don't think I think that there's secret people talking crap behind my back? <laughs> Without me knowing, I just don't have to look up who they are on the internet. I'm just like, yeah, it's probably everyone. I wish there was like a fake Russian news website that was feeding me information to confirm my social anxiety. It's like, yeah, conversation Alex Veluto have at party still makes people uncomfortable when they think about it. I have social anxiety. It's really bad. It makes me so awkward around people. And here's the problem with being awkward. The problem is not that you don't know when you're being awkward. You know. <laughs> it's just that your brain gives you no better options. I am so jealous of stupid people. Have you seen them just leave a train wreck of an interaction? They have that look of joy on their face. They're like, oh, I nailed that. <laughs> And everyone behind him is like, what just happened? <laughs> My brain, I know exactly how poorly I'm doing and I can't stop it. <laughs> like, you know when you're telling a story to someone and in the middle of your story you realize, oh no, the end of this story is not interesting at all. 
but you finish your boring story. You just keep talking. You see your friend's anticipation in their eyes and in your heart. You just know you have nothing. You're going to have to apologize for speaking at the end of this. You're just going to have to be like, I'm sorry. I was along for the ride as well. I don't know how it ends. I'm going to talk to the writer. Let's get a better ending to this story. My friend told me a story about how he went to a restaurant and the waiter gave someone the Heimlich maneuver. It was a crazy story. And then so I started telling him my story about how I went to a restaurant. And in the middle of telling it, I realized that the grand finale to my story was basically I had a waiter also one time. <laughs> He's like, what happened next? I'm like, I'd like to invoke the Fifth Amendment at this point. <laughs> But I love you. You know why I love you? You're here and you're listening and that's rare. I love people that listen and we do not like people that listen these days. We're so paranoid that everyone is listening to us all the time. The government is listening to all of us. I would love it if the government listened to everything I do. I could use the followers. <laughs> Obviously, I pay a therapist good money to listen to me. I just use the CIA sometimes to listen to me. I'm like, hey, I'm thinking about building a bomb because I'm having a really hard day today, CIA. <laughs> we complain about listeners. We complain that Facebook is listening to us because you'll say something to your friend and then later Facebook will show you an ad for the very thing that you were talking about. And we say, that's creepy. I think it's nice. <laughs> They're listening to me and giving me suggestions for things? My friends don't do that. <laughs> Never talking to my friend like, I can't commit to anything. And he's like, you know what you need? A wireless network with no contracts. <laughs> <laughs> we complain that Facebook listens to us. It's the only one that listens and we complain. I think Facebook would be sad if it knew we were complaining. It's like, excuse me for trying to be helpful, okay? I'm the only one that listens to you in your life. You're the one that brought up that you needed a new hemorrhoid cream, so I just showed you an ad for hemorrhoid cream. I don't see what the big deal is. I'm just trying to be a friend. I'm not telling anyone else. Let's just keep the hemorrhoid thing between us. That's as dirty as I'm gonna get, so. I don't think people are listening to us as much as we'd like to think. Like, we think that Alexa is listening to us because they gave Alexa a woman's name. Catch my drift. <laughs> Deep down, we know women listen to everything that you said, and they store that information and use it against you later in life. But Alexa is not a woman. You know how I know? Whenever I talk to my Alexa, it's always like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time with the connection. <laughs> like, Try again later, contact support. I'm like, that's my line, Alexa. If Alexa was really a woman, you wouldn't even have to talk to it. It would talk to you. <laughs> it would tell you what to do. <laughs> Here's a list of things for you to do. <laughs> I'll wait your approval on those things. <laughs> you know how else I know Alexa is a man? Because it doesn't understand what my wife is saying either. <laughs> my wife is always talking to Alexa. Alexa never responds. And my wife gets so frustrated. She's like, why won't Alexa listen to me? And like, I think it's just because you keep giving it a lot of commands, like right in a row. And you never really stop when you talk. You just keep going from topic to topic. So that's kind of hard for us, I mean her, to understand what you're saying. And I think if you slowed down, maybe she would hear you more. She's like, that's what Alexa thinks. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> it's insulting to call Alexa a woman's name. Alexa is a man. Women's brains are the most complex computers that the world has ever known. They can process thousands of problems and have grudges about all of them simultaneously. <laughs> Alexa's brain works the same way a man's brain does. It is a simple speech recognition call and response software. 
We're just listening for our name, and we give you just enough information to make you think we were listening. And we're just waiting for you to stop talking. I wish people listen to us as much as we think they do. I, like, I think I would love to have my identity stolen. I'd be flattered. I'm like, you want it to be me? <laughs> Let's see what you do with my identity. I haven't been able to do much with it. <laughs> we think that we're, the ways we protect our identity are so strange. Like when you go to the doctor, the only thing they ask you to confirm your identity is your name and birthday. You think, people should remember my birthday. Nope. That's the hospital's like, this is literally the highest level of encryption we could think of <laughs> to protect your most personal medical data. <laughs> I'd love it if my identity got stolen. Here's the thing, I'd love to see what someone could do with my identity if they weren't burdened with my personality. Because <laughs> that's the thing, they don't steal your personality with your identity, that'd be kind of cool. And be like, yeah, he's got my credit card number, but I also know he's not making eye contact with anyone. <laughs> When we get our identity stolen, we're not even mad about the money. I think we're just mad that the person is doing more with our identity than we ever have. <laughs> your credit card company calls you and you're like, did you just buy your dream house in Jamaica? You're like, no. <laughs> I don't have my act to get together enough to do that. Fake Alex is doing things that real Alex can't do. <laughs> Maybe fake Alex is the real Alex. But I'll tell you my identity. You want to know my identity? Yeah, I'll give you all the information. <laughs> I'm a, a married person. Uh, my birthday is March 28, 1989. It's coming up on Sunday. And I know by the end of the show, none of you are going to remember that. <laughs> I'm not ashamed of it. I, had a, I have a one-and-a-half-year-old baby. We had the baby six months before the pandemic. And... Uh, before, 10 months before that, we got married. <laughs> Some of you can do math. <laughs> I knew my wife for a period, and then we had a baby. <laughs> one sentence. My marriage was one sentence, and then we had a baby. It was crazy. I'm so happy I have a baby, though. He's the best. I felt so horrible for my wife during the pregnancy. Did you know women do most of the work? I hardly did anything. I did most of the work. I don't know who arranged that deal for you ladies, but you got screwed twice, I think, on that deal. That's insane. You should renegotiate. <laughs> they set pregnancy up like a group project from school. Remember those group projects from school where there's only the one slacker kid that helped on the first day and then waited until the paper is being turned in before he's like, hey, let's put my name on the cover sheet. That's how I was like at the hospital. I'm like, you know what, let's put my last name on this baby. I helped out for about two minutes at the beginning of this project. And I'd like partial credit, por favor. <laughs> Being a parent is so hard. Here's the best way I can describe it. Being a parent feels like you're in a mental institution where you're trapped with the thing that put you in the mental institution. It's like if you got checked into a mental institution, you're like, I'm afraid of clowns. And you walk into your room and there it's like, Buddy the Clown sitting on your bed. You're like, I don't think I'm gonna get better. With a baby, your house feels like a mental institution. Everyone speaks gibberish, not just the baby, everyone. No one is sleeping, everyone's crying for no reason, and Daniel Tiger is playing in the background, and you can't even tell if it's on or if it's just in your head. So that all happened, and then the pandemic hit, and I'm like, oh, I'm pretty stressed. <laughs> So I started going to a therapist, which, I, as a comedian, that was pretty late in my life to go to a therapist. <laughs> if you hear a comedian say they go to a therapist, your reaction should be, of course. <laughs> but my therapist is really great. He's really funny. He does an hour of material every week for me. It's so great. <laughs> His favorite bit and my favorite bit is where he blames everything on my parents. 
That's my favorite bit. I'm going to do it for you tonight. It makes me feel so good. <laughs> Therapists don't like your parents. Did you know that? That's the first thing you, they'd say when you walk in. They're like, do you have parents? I'm like, yeah. He's like, those SOBs. They did this to you, huh? <laughs> like, you know nothing about me, but I think you're onto something, Doc. <laughs> How did you know? He's like, oh, I could tell. <laughs> I finally had to admit to him that I was a parent. He's like, oh, you SOP. You did it too. <laughs> like, I'm sorry. <laughs> what do I do to not mess up my kid? He's like, oh, there's no chance of that not happening. <laughs> and it's true. Any parents here tonight? We've got some people active parenting. There you go. Yeah, you worry about your kid. You worry about messing them up. And let me tell you, it's going to happen. No matter what you do, you could be perfect. You're still going to mess up your kid. The only thing you can hope is to mess up your kid less than how much your parents messed you up. That's the bar. That's the creed of the parent. That's why everyone, when they become a parent, their slogan becomes, you kids have it good. You have no idea how bad I had it. And the further back in time you go, the worse the parents were. That's why the evolution chart looks like it does. It's just kids getting beat down by their parents. The further back in time you go, and eventually you get to a dude that's like, you kids had it good, my dad was a monkey. <laughs> and that's why we're all messed up, is because our first parents were monkeys. Don't you feel like a monkey sometimes? If someone cuts you off in traffic, you're like, ah, ah, ah. Someone says something boring to you, you're like, Ugh. Someone explains a YouTube video to you instead of showing you a YouTube video to you, you're like, I'm going to throw poop in your face. <laughs> and I don't mean to offend people that don't believe the monkey story. If you don't believe the monkey story, you believe the Adam and Eve story, which is just as crazy of a story. And they were bad parents, too. <laughs> I'm sorry, they were. Imagine being their kid. They're like, Dad, Mom, how'd you meet? They're like, oh, we were naked in the garden. Talking snake was there. <laughs> Your mom came out of my rib. It was crazy. <laughs> the kid's like, well, how am I going to meet who I'm going to marry? He's like, I don't know. Have you talked to your sister? <laughs> yeah, they were bad parents. <laughs> Either monkeys or Adam and Eve. That's why we're messed up. Let's cut each other some slack. We all have bad parents. <laughs> It's just how it is. I feel bad. I get it though, as a parent now. I get why my parents were so stressed all the time and made me all stressed out because it's hard being a parent. And my parents are baby boomers and I'm a millennial. And I know I have the hairline of Gen X, but I am a millennial. This is what we look like now. <laughs> We're not young, we're tired and kind of fat, and we have kids, and we kind of commiserate with the boomers at this point. I feel bad for the baby boomers, because they got raised by the greatest generation. Those are my grandparents for the greatest generation, which was a nickname they gave themselves. <laughs> you know what they call that same generation in Germany? Nazis. So, if you evened it out, it's not that great. Average generation. That's got to be a lot of pressure growing up, having your parents be the greatest generation. And then they name you baby boomers. They name you after how frisky they were after they got back from World War II. <laughs> They're like, yeah, we were pretty randy in those trenches. And you got back, had a bunch of babies, and you're one of them, and you're not special. And in comparison, they called us millennials. That's kind of nice. I assume because I lived through the millennium, which you remember the millennium? Y2K? When all the boomers freaked out because they didn't know how computers worked? <laughs> Pretty typical of their generation. <laughs> They're not good at computers, and they don't have to be. My mom's a baby boomer, but she's also a teacher. She's been teaching for like 30 years. She's retiring this year. She's this amazing lady. But because of COVID, they made her teach online for her last year of school. Yeah. And so I'm trying to teach her how to use technology for the first time. And like I showed her how to do Google Forms so she could uh, send out quizzes. And her first question to me was, will the Russian hackers hack into these quiz scores? 
I'm like, yeah, mom, that's what they're after. <laughs> they're just licking their lips for the opportunity. <laughs> they're like, yes, I am into mainframe. Oh, look what we have here. Mrs. Veluto's fourth grade pop quiz course. <laughs> Let's see how they did on social studies pop quiz. Looks to me that little Timmy did not study. <laughs> and report back to Putin this information. <laughs> this is exactly the intel we need on America. <laughs> Their weakness, social studies. <laughs> Yeah, I'm a millennial. I grew up part of my life before technology and part after. And the internet was the first time I kind of got a hint that my parents didn't know what they were doing. <laughs> like, remember when your parents showed up on Facebook? Some of you, a few are the parents that showed up on Facebook. <laughs> You're like, what? <laughs> this was an event? I wasn't welcome? What's going on? <laughs> Yeah, before the parents showed up on Facebook, Facebook was a very different place. It came out when I was in high school, and it was just me and my friends. We played Farmville. We didn't know what we were doing. We were like trading coins or something. There was no politics on Facebook at all. And then one day, all the parents showed up on Facebook. <laughs> it felt like on the same day. <laughs> It was very unexpected. I woke up that day just expecting to watch funny cat videos like I did every morning. And then all of a sudden, Facebook was full of everyone's dad with a selfie he took up his nose as his profile picture, <laughs> saying, copy and paste if you agree. One like equals one prayer. Share is an amen. You're like, what is happening? <laughs> And some of you are like, what, that's not how you use Facebook? <laughs> no. <laughs> You're bringing your MSN email game to Facebook. That's not how it works. That's why they keep inventing all these new websites, is so we can get away from our parents, because they keep following us. That's why the, I'm not going on TikTok, ever. Those kids can have fun. They're literally dancing at how happy they are that no old people are on that app. <laughs> They're killing it, those TikTok kids. And I respect them, I'm not going on there. That's so good for them to know at an early age how dumb parents are. I learned way too late in life how dumb parents are. I was like 25. That, that should be the talk that you get as a kid, not the birds and the bees. It should be that your dad is a dummy talk. <laughs> As soon as my kid's able to talk, I'm going to be like, look, I think you're old enough to know that I'm just kind of winging it over here. So just don't take anything I say seriously. I love you. I'm just doing the best that I can. <laughs> but, like, childhood is hard. That's, being a kid is why you get messed up, too. You don't interpret things the right way. Like, I went to school in the 90s, and they got the computers in the school for the first time. And instead of teaching us computer programming or something useful, they said, let's let them play Oregon Trail. <laughs> they don't need computer programming skills. They need how to learn how to survive the unforgiving Western frontier. That will be more applicable to their life. So I was like in second grade in charge of a family in this game, and I just watched them slowly die as I crossed the plains <laughs> from every communicable disease known to man. I would get mad at them. I'm like, what are you doing? Are you not washing your hands? Licking the doorknobs at Fort Walla Walla? Get it together. I'm too busy to help you. I'm shooting buffalo over here. That's what you did the whole class. You weren't taking care of your family. You were obliterating the buffalo population. That's why buffalo almost went extinct in real life. It was way more fun to hunt buffalo than to pay attention to your dumb daughter, Mary, with cholera. <laughs> Remember that game? You'd be shooting buffalo, and that thing pops up like, your daughter, Mary, now has cholera. And you keep shooting buffalo. <laughs> It's like you don't have enough room in your wagon for all this buffalo meat, and you keep shooting buffalo. It's like your daughter Mary has died of cholera. You're like, eh, more room in my wagon for buffalo meat now. <laughs> That's what we played. And they're like, pay attention, kids, this is history. 
if that's history, they should just play Call of Duty in school now. It's the same level of history in that game. <laughs> I played Call of Duty. The last one I played was the World War II one, and I'm super bad at Call of Duty. And I'm, I hope it's not historically accurate, because if it's historically accurate based on how I played it, that means some guy left his family, went to World War II, and immediately went in a corner like this. <laughs> I heard those Nazis. <laughs> I don't see them anywhere. <laughs> what he doesn't see is a German tank slowly creeping behind him, and he gets flattened by a German tank 13 seconds into World War II. <laughs> I hope that didn't happen in history. Imagine being that guy's wife explaining to your grandkids how Pop Pop died. <laughs> Man, how did Grandpa die in the war? Well, you see, your grandfather was what was known as a noob. <laughs> And he went to war and was immediately pwned. <laughs> it was very sad. <laughs> I'm still out of breath. <laughs> <laughs> Which one of you is a real estate agent? Or both of you? Neither one of us. Neither? Get out. <laughs> what are you doing here? Oh, you work with the agents. Oh, cool. What do you do? Home warranties. Home warranties. There you go. Thanks to Ibix for providing the concessions. That's cool. I assume in order to get the concessions, you had to call in, get approved for the concessions. When someone comes to you to give you the concessions, they give you a bill, and then you send it back to the Ibix to get reimbursed. <laughs> I only used my home warranty once. Is that how it works? <laughs> I, you know, the home warranty game sounds awesome. It's, your agent is like, you're going to get a home warranty, and they're going to pay for it. And you're like, OK. And you sell your house. You're like, you got to buy this person a home warranty. I'm like, I don't even know what it is. So you, I just besmirched your whole profession, and I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's OK. I'm up here. You're killing it. And I got a new fridge. It just reminded me I got to replace my fridge on my home warranty, right? Is that how it works? I don't know. I have it. I have no idea how it works. I don't know how a lot of things work. What do you do for the home warranties? I sell. Oh, you sell them. Okay. Well, that's easy. So you're getting one and they're paying for it. Uh, okay. Is, there, is it even an option to not get the home warranty? It is? Oh, darn it. This just shows me I need to be more assertive. I refinanced. I think I had to buy myself the home warranty. The, the bank was like, you're getting a home warranty and the seller is going to pay for it. And I'm like, I'm the seller and the buyer. And I'm like, I don't know. I just went along with it. I'm like, okay. Anyone do HELOCs here? I'm looking for a HELOC. No? No one wants to approve me. I'm... Oh, you do? Cool. We'll talk after the show. He's going he's gonna to assume what I make based on my comedy. And factor that into the income calculation. That's awesome. Well, cool. Thanks for coming. I don't know what I was going to say. I just got distracted by this beautiful couple. How long have you been together? 24 years. 24 years? Did you meet in the home warranty circuit? We met when we were up. Oh, you met when you were little growing up. Oh, cool. Like, Do you want to grow up and grow old with me and sell home warranties? <laughs> yeah, and he's like, yeah, that sounds good. I'll sell them. They don't have a choice. <laughs> <laughs> I'd watch that movie. <laughs> Home warranty, the movie. <laughs> Home is where the warranty is. <laughs> that's, a, that's a lovely story. So you, 20 years, so you're like 24 now? What's, how old are you now? You, I'm 45. 45? Dang, I'm, I look older than you. I'm only... <laughs> 
I'm gonna blame the Diet Coke that I'm bragging about drinking all the time. I drink no water. <laughs> There's some times in my life where I'm like, I haven't had water in four days. <laughs> Yeah, my wife gets very upset at me about it. It's like the only fight that we've had. She's like, you need to drink more water. Diet Coke is bad for you. I'm like, that is what big water wants you to think. It's propaganda from the big water corporations. And my problem with water is it's flat and it has no Diet Coke in it. It's terrible. It's not even trying. You drink it, you're like, ugh, no syrup in this. What? Is there a mistake with the fountain? And like, no, this is water. Ugh. I hate water so much. And my wife is like, how do you hate water? Your body is 70% water. I'm like, that is the exact amount of myself that I hate. <laughs> Doesn't seem like a coincidence to me. I hate the moist parts of myself. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't have the word moist without water. It's out to get ya. I want nothing to do with water. I hate swimming in it too. Because as a man, you have to take your shirt off when you swim. But when it comes to my body, I like to keep things as vague as possible. But when I swim, everything is wet and shiny and specific. <laughs> my least favorite part about Water is, is swimming, that is, is this. Did you know this about swimming? When you go under the water, you can't breathe. <laughs> That's creepy. Swimming is so creepy because water is going, hey, how about you take your clothes off and I'll choke you a little bit. <laughs> I'm not into that at all. I'm a dry bar comedian. This is not cool. Here's something I'm kind of ashamed of, but mostly proud of. I drink so much Diet Coke that I have 20,000 7-Eleven loyalty points. <laughs> you have to spend $1 to get one point, and I have 20,000 points. Do the math on that, that's a lot of Diet Coke. No kidney stones though, right? High five. <laughs> Never redeeming those points. Never, ever. You want to know why? Every time I walk into 7-Eleven and I go to the cash register, the cashier is always like, huh? you have 20,000 points. And I like getting that kind of respect. <laughs> I feel like an Old West legend bursting into a saloon in a town and my reputation precedes me. <laughs> I just come in and the lady's like, huh? My stars. I'd heard tell the legend, but I didn't reckon it was true. And I tip my hat and I go, you better believe it, little lady. They call me the big gulp kid. She's like, well, why don't you redeem those points? I reckon you could get a taquito. A dry, dry taquito. It's been rolling on our grill since Tuesday last. <laughs> now, I don't do it for the taquitos, ma'am. And I don't do it for them dusty hot dogs you got on there, neither. I just do it to show my loyalty. And I reckon I do have enough points that I could buy this here establishment. But for now, I will leave just as mysteriously as I came. Don't know how home warranties work. I barely figured out how health insurance worked. Did you know this? Uh, health insurance, you pay the monthly thing and then it's to make sure that if you don't go over a certain amount, dollars of sick every year, then that's when you get your health paid for. In summation, it's like you're placing a bet that you won't get a certain amount of sick every year. And the only way you win the bet is if you get more sick than you planned. <laughs> and I'm not being political here. I don't think it should be socialized or anything, but I don't think it should be gambling either. <laughs> Your health insurance company looks you up and down and like, all right, you've been sickly before, you drink a lot of Diet Coke. I give you $5,000 a year and you're like, I'll take those odds. 
Have you ever met your deductible in the year? You feel so good. You're like, I bet the over punk. <laughs> Pay up. It's me sliding my insurance card. You meet it every year? Oh man, I can't believe you yelled that out in public. <laughs> <laughs> you just broke every hip alive I've ever heard. <laughs> so what are your diseases? <laughs> it's chronic, right? Let's get into it. <laughs> you had cancer? All right, let's go into this. This is a funny, funny topic. I'm sorry you have cancer. You had it? Remission? Yes. Give it up. Remiss! There you go. Look, I don't mean to ruffle any feathers, but I hate cancer, and I don't care who knows it. I won't ask you what kind of cancer it was, even though I assume she'll probably yell it out later. Colon! <laughs> this guy in my neighborhood got diagnosed with colon cancer this one time and he put it on Facebook. And I like didn't know how to help him <laughs> on Facebook. It felt awkward. But I did notice that his post is full of grammatical errors. I'm like, I know how to help you there, but I probably shouldn't do that. <laughs> he was missing a colon though. <laughs> So it tends to be like, well, it looks like you forgot to check your colon. <laughs> I'd be like, yeah, I know. <laughs> Do you need a kidney or anything? I got a spare. I'm good. I'm good. That's one of the few organs I still have left. Oh my gosh. That's so sad. I think you should have my kidney then. You can have three kidneys. Have a, that's my goal to donate a kidney one day. It's a weird goal. I just like the idea that I could be in two places at once. <laughs> and I like the fact that God gave us spare parts. I think that's cool. <laughs> can I have, what, what blood type are you? Let, I can help you. I don't know. I donate platelets. I'm trying to do the work. I don't know how to help. Oh, no. I did, I donate, like, you donate platelets? Uh, oh, you donate blood? Look at this saintly person we have in our presence. She should be the one on stage. I'm just a chunk of coal telling yuck yucks. She's like a hero person. That's awesome. She's laughing at it. You're right. I have a poster of you in my room. You're my hero. That's great. Good for you. <laughs> well, let me know how I can help. Uh, give you a casserole. I don't know. <laughs> Did you get a lot of food when you had cancer from neighbors? That's kind of where neighbors are at with the whole cancer thing. They're like, we don't know how to help. Maybe some cheese in a casserole. What was your favorite meal you got when you were sick? Probably the food that she brought me. There you go. Yeah, she's like, I'm giving this to her. She has cancer. <laughs> He's yelling it throughout the neighborhood. That's cool. I feel the whole room going like, can we stop talking about cancer, please? <laughs> you know what? I tend to agree with you. I just want to be supportive. you got to understand what an awkward situation this is for me. <laughs> I didn't ask for this. <laughs> I didn't ask who has cancer in the room. It's not my fault. Don't turn on me. I'm nice. I'm anti-cancer. <laughs> I've had some run-ins with the doctors and stuff. I don't think they know as much as they're saying that they do. I feel the same way at a doctor that I do at a mechanic. <laughs> you know that feeling you get at a mechanic where they're just saying whatever and you're like, have to agree with them because you don't know. <laughs> They're like, your torquing flangulator isn't broken. And like, That's what I was going to say. <laughs> Saying the flangulator isn't torquing? All right. And doctors are the same. 
I don't think they know what they're talking about. We all, we all think doctors are smart because they went to college. You all went to college, probably, or you didn't because you're real estate agents. I don't know. <laughs> I'll just get the license later. <laughs> you go to college? You didn't graduate, but you went. What did you major in when you went? Business. Okay. So even though you majored in business, I know the question that was asked most in your major was, will the test be multiple choice? <laughs> That's the question in every major. And doctors went to college. They have multiple choice knowledge, just like the rest of us. <laughs> That's why whenever you go to the doctor, your doctor's always like, well, it could be one of three things. <laughs> we have no idea. <laughs> Well, cool. I, I don't know why I have this instinct to keep talking to you, but I support you. I just, my heart goes out to you. I feel so bad. Who else has cancer here? I don't know. <laughs> I get it. I'm, I kind of can commiserate with my parents. I was talking about my parents. Let's change the topic back to my parents. How about that? Okay. Yeah, cool. She doesn't want to talk about cancer either. Let's talk about my childhood trauma. It's not a big deal. I get it though. It's, and I kind of look forward to getting older, if I'm being honest. Don't, they, don't old people look like they're having fun? Like my generation's all uptight. We're so worried. We're so stressed out about wasting people's time. And old people could not care less about wasting everyone's time. They're my heroes. I'm pretty sure buffets pay old people to hold up the all-you-can-eat process. <laughs> Whenever you're at a buffet, you're just behind Madge who's trying to figure out what creamed corn is for the first time for some reason. They're so good at wasting time, old people. I'm like, you don't have a lot of time left. <laughs> you're wasting the rest of it. They have all these moves that seem fun, like they'll order stuff that's not even on the menu. They'll walk into a place and be like, I want an egg salad sandwich. And the kid's like, this is Panda Express. <laughs> they don't care. They're just happy to be there. And you always think old people, they move to Florida when they retire. It's not true. They move in front of you in line. <laughs> That's where they live. You can send them postage to in front of you in line. They're never behind you. You're never at Wendy's and... Like, oh good, this guy that's about to order grits in this Wendy's is behind me in line. That's a true story. This guy was in front of me, old guy, at Wendy's. He got up to the counter and was like, I want grits. And the kid was like, we don't have grits. So the old man just waited. That's your move when you're old. You just turn every situation to a Mexican standoff. He's like, I want grits. I'm on the brink of death. I'm willing to run out the clock on this one. Your move, compadre. <laughs> you got to get that guy grits now. He's willing to go down at your Wendy's counter. You got to fill a frosty cup full of grits at Cracker Barrel. You got to make it happen. And they did. That's crazy. They did. They filled it. I don't know how. It was some loaves and fishes style miracle from the spirit of Dave Thomas himself. Like 10 minutes later, they gave him a cup of Wendy's grits and he took them and he didn't say thank you, of course. And then he pulled out his checkbook. <laughs> he wasn't done wasting everyone's time. He had only just begun. <laughs> he was gonna pay for this food that didn't exist with the form of payment on the brink of extinction. If you're paying with a checkbook in public, you're one step away from paying with a Blockbuster gift card. <laughs> you have no regard for people's time. <sighs> oh, man. Well, thanks for coming out, you guys. I really do love you so much. Thanks for being you. I appreciate you and just know that I love you. Um, and uh, you can love yourself, too. It's... It's nice, that's what I learned from therapy. It was a convoluted way to get to that point, and I don't know why I'm saying it now, but <laughs> you know, try and be meaningful or something. I just really like being married too. I remember being single 
from talking to this buddy of mine who's single still. And he's like, dude, I got to get back into dating shape. And I remember that. Like when you're single, you can't tell if that empty feeling inside you is hunger or loneliness. <laughs> so you eat a lot and then you feel like you have to lose weight to date someone. It's like this really messed up feeling where you feel like you have to choose between food and a relationship. Which is weird because if we're being honest, a relationship may or may not make you happy. Food, however, will make you happy. <laughs> Every time. It's undefeated. That's why you go to dinner on dates. You're trying to compare. <laughs> right? You're like, are you worth giving up this delicious food for? Do I have to get in shape for you? If it's a bad date, you're like, no, I'm sticking with the carbs. <laughs> I'm staying in my relationship with food. We have relationships with food. That's why if you eat enough at one restaurant, they give you loyalty points. There's commitment involved. I'm loyal to Papa John's. He is the father of my food, baby. And I'm loyal to him. And it's not like I haven't been tempted by other chains. I know I can go to any sketchy strip mall. There's always a little Caesars going, I'll do anything you want for five dollars, sweetheart. Little Caesars is the lady of the night of the pizza world. <laughs> it's not good, but at least it's pizza. <laughs> Even the menu items kind of sound like something that they would offer to you, like hot and ready, five dollars. <laughs> deep, deep dish is eight dollars. Three meat treat is twelve. I don't do quality and I do not do delivery. <laughs> but I will give you the extra most bestest. <laughs> Sorry to do that at Dry Bar. Those are legit, real menu items from Little Caesars, though. I didn't change them. I thought it was just deep dish at first, and it was deep, deep dish. And I know that because I went to Little Caesars. <laughs> you have a relationship with your food. That's how it's supposed to be. That's how God intended it. That's why it's what you put at the beginning of his book. The first thing God told Adam and Eve was like, look, I need you to make babies, but don't eat the fruit. It's got a lot of sugar in it, and you're both naked, and I don't want any fatties in my garden. So stick to the unlimited salad bar I've made for you. And Adam and Eve are like, ugh, not worth it. <laughs> so they ate the sugar, and then God was like, all right, out of the pool, both of you. I have a confession. Bill Cosby also had an Adam and Eve joke at one point where at the end of it, God says, get out of the pool. But it's my policy that I like, I feel like it's okay to steal Bill Cosby's jokes without his consent. That's kind of how I feel. No, I'm good. It's good for me. I'm sticking it, right? I don't know. I'm not brave. It's a cheap shot. I'll leave you with a historical fact. It's my favorite historical fact. Did you know they've discovered 118 pyramids in Egypt? And I was wondering how there got to be so many. And I figured some guy must have gone up to his friend in Egypt and was like, okay, if you build two pyramids and those two people build two pyramids, <laughs> and those two people build two pyramids, his friend is like, I don't know, man. It seems like a scheme to me, but. Whatever you say, Pharaoh doTERRA. <laughs> Thank you very much. Have a good night. Keep selling houses.